Rick Samer. He's the CTO and co-founder of a company called Rokana, and he'll tell you about it. Um, this talk is going to be about uh, building an event-oriented data platform. Um, uh, Eric has mentioned that um, you know if we finish early, then we can do Q&A, but uh, we can also use the time to do the presentation. So uh, he doesn't mind actually staying after the presentation for the Q&A. So without, uh, without further ado, Eric, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Um, I know uh, I only have a little bit amount of time, and I grew up in New York City, so I'm really good at talking really fast. If I talk too fast, throw something at me and let me know. Um, I want to thank all the volunteers, by the way, and Subhash and the rest of the team. Uh, great event today, great turnout. It's amazing, 2,400 people. That's kind of exciting. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about building uh, a system for machine and event-oriented data. Um, I'll get a little bit more into what I mean by that, uh, just give you a little bit of detail. Before I do that, um, I have a huge pet peeve. A friend of mine just tweeted about this on Twitter uh, just yesterday, about giving technical advice without context, right? Go do this thing, it works for me, and it turns out that my requirements are totally different from your requirements. So I always like to set some context, help people know sort of why we're doing the things that we're doing and what got us there and what we tried and what didn't work. And believe me, we tried a bunch of things that didn't work. Um, so in that spirit, I want to give you a little bit of context about sort of what we do at Rokana. And I'm the CTO and co-founder. I promise I'm not sales pitching as much as possible. Again, if you catch me sales pitching, please throw things at me and stop me. Um, but just give you a little bit of uh, visibility. Rokana builds a system for the operation of modern data centers. I won't get a too, too much more into that. So it mostly talks about keeping the lights on, understanding what the machines are doing, how they're performing, trying to predict failures, all of the stuff you kind of expect when I say keeping the lights on. Um, so it's all about triage and diagnostics, exploration of what's going on in the data center, understanding trends for things like capacity planning. Um, do I have enough machines running application servers or web servers or database servers, those kinds of things. Um, and then sort of what I'm gonna to totally hand wave around and say advanced analytics. And that's where all like the fancy math comes in with people who are much smarter than me. Luckily I can hire those people and they do the, the really smart stuff. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that but not in great detail. That's where a lot of the data science stuff happens at Rokana and it's mostly around things like anomaly detection. You know, the number of failed logins on our Active Directory controller, domain controllers are normally like this, they go like this, you know, that's weird. You know, take that, wake somebody up, let them know that something unusual might be happening. Um, so our data is primarily things like log data, metrics, time series metrics. They can be things like human activity. So think HTTP clickstream, you know, people browsing products on a website. Um, and we do a lot of like correlating. Somebody, uh, a machine failed, and yes, you should fix that, but that machine had 250,000 customers currently accessing it, and of those, 30 of those people are whales that buy like lots of stuff from your store, so you probably wanna reach out to them and understand like, you know, bribe them with a coupon or something like that to, to make sure that they're not angry at your organization. Um, so pretty much anything that occurs in the data center, and we'll do like everything from environmental sensors all the way up to like high order business transactions, like shipping and receiving and those kinds of things. So pretty much anything that can be modeled as an event, and I'm gonna talk a lot about what that is and what that means to us. Um, we are enterprise software, and what I mean by that is we build stuff and ship it. We are not software as a service. This actually really informs a lot of the technical decisions you make. You will not hear about Haskell. You will not hear about Clojure. You will hear me complain about Scala bytecode compatibility because those are the types of things that we worry about, right? So things like year-long, no backward incompatible changes or API breaking changes and stuff like that. All that stuff is super duper important to us. Um, but I'm not gonna talk too much more about what we do. I'm gonna talk more about how we built it. So, you know, again, just some context to help you understand how we, how we think about the problem. So typical use cases for us are on the order of millions of events, because again, people say the word scale and big data, and they never put numbers to it, so I'm gonna put some numbers to it. So for us, this means millions of events per second coming into the system. 
And we measure big or scale in a couple of different dimensions. We measure the rate of new data entering the system, the amount of data you retain online, and the amount of data that you can actually query or process or do something with. In our world, we don't believe that frozen or archived data is, uh, is usable, so it might as well not exist. So when I talk about online data, I mean data that you can actually query, that you can actually do something with, you can ask a question of, all that other kind of good stuff. When I talk about full fidelity retention, what I mean is we don't dither that data, we don't aggregate it, we don't play tricks like that, we don't roll it up to the daily level. We actually retain the individual events in perpetuity. And in a lot of cases, like in compliance use cases, that's actually what people are paying us for, is I want to know exactly that Bob from shipping and receiving is trying to access like, you know, corporate hiring plans, you know, that are restricted documents and that shouldn't be a thing that's happening and I need to be able to audit that. So things like quality of service, credit card transactions, are they happening fast enough, fraud detection, forensic diagnosis, um, diagnostics, security use cases, to some extent, we don't really consider ourselves a security company, but you get the idea. And user, user behavior, you know, the sort of higher order capture and correlate, understand how these things relate to one another. So going down slightly, um, I'm gonna talk about our, I'm gonna talk mostly about the data platform portion of what Rokana does. I'm not gonna talk about our application, which is all the fancy pants, you know, graphs and charts and show me this versus that, because I really wanna talk about the data management and stream processing side of it. I'm going to talk about everything to the left of Apache Kafka. How many of you are familiar with Apache Kafka? Okay, good, for the rest of you. It's a uh, high throughput, paralyzed messaging system. Think publish, subscribe, shove a bunch of data into it, and a bunch of people can read from that data. Beyond that, think JMS, a better version of JMS, or AMQP, or Rabbit, or you know, like whatever. So we use Apache Kafka as the sort of central nervous system of, of all the data flow at Rokana. To the left of it, all the sources of that data these are all the places we acquire data from. So big data sources for us are things like syslog, tailing files and directories you know, in, in real time as they're written to, pulling out host metrics, service metrics, uh, log4j appenders, there's lots of Java application servers and microservices, so we pull data out of those things. And then we have REST APIs and things like that. These two guys, um, sorry, I'm also partially colorblind. This color is Rokana stuff. This color, whatever those are, this color is open source stuff. Um, and those colors are data sets or sources of data. So you guys can fight over what colors they are. I think they're purple, orange, and blue, but we can, we can have that discussion later. Um, so uh, primarily our two main inputs into the system are our agent, which happens to be written in, and again, here's where our requirements and context come into play. Our agent runs in what I call like behind enemy lines. It has to run on individual servers, on all different kinds of platforms. It has to fit in roughly 10% of one core, you know, without chewing up too much in the way of resources. It has to run in about 10 megabytes of memory. So we decided to write that in Go with a mix of C and C++ where we drop down to the kernel layer to do things like iNotify in Linux or for the Windows uh, event log, um, those kinds of things, OS specific stuff. Otherwise it's primarily written in Go, compiles down to machine code. So um, that's one major source for us. Our other major source uh, is our Java API, which between you and me, is just a really thin wrapper around the Kafka APIs. We only do a little bit of additional stuff on top of that to uh, make life a little bit easier for, for dealing with things like when exceptions occur and uh, for marshalling things into our event format, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. Once data is all flowing through and in Kafka, in real time, then we get into how we process and query and store all of this data. Not in that order, process, then store, then query. Um, so again, we're starting with Kafka here and we're talking about everything to the right of that. And all the way at the very far right is our application that does things like anomaly detection and fancy pants dashboards and all these other kinds of things. I like the phrase fancy pants, you guys are getting stuck with it today. So. Um, 
the uh, vast majority of the processing we do, and I'm going to get much more in depth here, follows this model of taking an event, moving it through a series of different processing stages, everything from transformation, which does things like enrichment and cleansing and parsing, and there's lots of stuff to be parsed in the world of logs. Uh, our, our life, sometimes we joke that like our life is just writing regexes. But, um, so we do a lot of that kind of stuff. Then there's things like metric aggregation, anomaly detection, all these other kinds of things. I'm gonna talk to you about how these things all stitch together. Um, the punchline though is that we do some processing and in certain cases, that data then flows into storage systems so that it's available for query. But in other cases, we do enrichment and reprocessing and restructuring of that data and shove it back into Kafka which creates this sort of composable event loop so we can rearrange the order that those jobs function on data in different ways. I'll give you an example in a minute. Our two primary stores of data are HDFS, the Apache Hadoop Distributed File System. Um, and uh, we used to use Apache Solar for all of our real time or full text uh, uh, search of log data. It turns out that we ran into a bunch of scalability caps there. Happy to talk about that in great detail. Uh, offline if folks are interested. I've also given talks on it. I complain in the videos. Um, if you want more of this um, and you want to watch it on your own time. Um, and our application, based on what the user is trying to do, will pick actually different query engines. So if somebody's looking to say, show me all fa failed logins per minute per host over the last three years, we actually use uh, Apache Impala which is a parallel SQL query engine that runs on top of Apache Parquet files, which is a columnar format in to on top of HDFS. But if somebody's doing like traditional think Splunk style or Elasticsearch Cabana, you know, find me all logs that mention the stack trace, blah, you know, that goes through uh, our Rokana search, uh, search engine. Everything in the system, I'm showing one box here for these things, but everything in our system is scale out, multi-node, nothing runs on a single box, everything's HA, we'll leader election and quorums and group membership out to Wazoo. Uh, so our platform team is really composed of a bunch of you know, big, big, data, big data people. Is this right? Is it 2.50? Am I like out of time already? Oh, okay, what time do I go to? What time am I going to? Okay. Let's do that. Oh, 2.50 was the start. Great. <laughs> We're going to have fun here, guys. Um, I might be on a little bit of sleep. Um, so, so yeah, so we, we use these two different engines uh, to decide how to pull data back and do different kinds of aggregation and stuff like that. And there's quite a bit of trickery there. I'm happy to answer questions as we go through the rest of the slide. There's a bunch of guarantees that we make as a product. And again, this is sort of contextual information. We guarantee to our customers that there's no single point of failure. That's like enterprise 101. You sort of get nailed to the wall if you have single points of failure. Um, all components scale horizontally. And to be intellectually honest as a distributed system you know, database person, yes, we're totally positive that there's a limit but it typically is what the customer is willing to fork out in terms of machines. It's not, the, it's not the technology. And the mission that we have in the platform team is the scaling problem should always be a function of what the customer is willing to throw at it in terms of dollars for hardware, not, oh, we don't handle more than 10 machines or 20 machines or 100 machines. It should be a function of how much they want to pay um, in hardware, not license. That's another story. Um, Data retention and latency. And by retention, I mean how much data can I keep online and queryable that I can do stuff with. Again, should be a function of cost, not the technology. Um, and what I mean by latency is end-to-end -end latency. So the way we measure end-to-end -end latency is the time from when data is actually produced. A Cisco device says, hey, firewall reject, whatever, to when data is actually queryable and shows up in the UI, which from a component complexity perspective is a pretty deep pipeline, right? I just showed you guys like all the boxes and the arrows. Every one of those boxes and arrows does stuff which takes resources and things like that. Um, so we measure latency in milliseconds. 
our desired end-to-end -end latency is sub 10 milliseconds. If life gets longer than 10 milliseconds, I get squirrely and my team gets mad because then I am giving them a lot of trouble about why that is the case. Um, so that gives you some idea. Millions of events, 10 milliseconds, queryable, right? That's what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, if it starts to slow down, the answer should be throw more hardware at that problem, parallelize it over a larger number of machines. That should always be possible. Now, there are lots of cases where that's not, but we try and try for that anyway. Um, if you're not, how many people have like taken classes in like distributed systems and you know that kind of stuff? Okay, a couple of people, I see half hands raised. I'm not gonna quiz you, it's okay. You can admit it. This is a safe place. Um, so uh, in messaging systems in general, there's like this uh, theoretical thing that goes, you can be at least once delivery, you can be at most once delivery, or you can be exactly once, right? So for every message, as things start to break down, you can either get duplicates, which is uh, at least once, you can get data loss at most once, you know, so you sort of prioritize for uh, never delivering more than once, or you can be exactly once. Everybody wants exactly once, and it's stupid hard to do. Um, and you have to play all kinds of games to try and trick things into being exactly once delivery. Happy to talk about that in the hallway. It's a great conversation. Um, so anytime anybody ever tells you we do exactly once guaranteed delivery, call bullshit. You'll be right like 90% of the time, and you look really smart, and you'll feel really good about yourselves. Don't do that. That's mean. Um, so uh, we fake this so that it looks like exactly once delivery. And for those in the room that say how, the answer is item potent delivery with some key duplication for Kafka messages. Um, this means you know there's some failure guarantees around here. So as long as no more than n minus one Kafka brokers fail, we will guarantee that a message that has been delivered will finally wind up, will eventually wind up at its final destination. I say eventually on purpose because uh, the seven fallacies of distributed programming say that a message can be infinitely delayed. Um, so you can never guarantee delivery in like, at least in theory. Um, all operations need to be online operations, right? So if you're monitoring the data center, if you're the thing that wakes people up in the middle of the night, turns out you're not actually allowed to say to customers, hey, we're gonna be down for eight hours while we upgrade this. They get really pissed off. So we don't do that, uh, we can't do that. This includes things like adding additional capacity to the cluster or upgrading kernels and all sorts of other good stuff. All that stuff needs to be online. Um, and I talked about the exactly once delivery and I do mean appears to be delivered exactly once because otherwise I'd be lying. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I mean by events. When we model our world, we model everything as an event. Every log message, every metric sample, every user activity, I hovered over a product on the website, I clicked on something, all those things to us are events. Each event has a bunch of standard fields that are guaranteed to be present. Uh, a timestamp, which is um, millisecond uh, accurate epoch, um, and uh, specifically in GMT, because absolutely everybody does everything in GMT, right? Okay, if you don't, if you're thinking, oh, not me, you're doing it wrong. Um, so it contains a timestamp, an event type, which sort of acts like a class. So if you think about like a Java class or a Python class or something like that, um, it's sort of the type of the event. And it can be something really generic, like an HTTP request, or it can be much more specific, like uh, a Microsoft IIS HTTP request, which has additional information. Um, we then have sort of what we call sort of our three primary dimensions that describe where this event came from. The physical location, the host or VM, and the service. And those can be used in different ways. So like if you were running in AWS, for instance, your location might be uh, US West 2A, which tells you the availability zone that that, that service or host was running in. Um, host and service are roughly obvious. Uh, they're Unix processes in, or Linux processes in, uh, in the Linux world. They're Windows services in the other world. The body is interesting. So the body, 
because we really wanted to be able to handle any kind of event data that comes through, including things like wacky core dumps and like really binary stuff. Um, our body is a, uh, a byte array. It's just an unparsed binary blob. And then we have what we call type-specific key value pairs or attributes, which are uh, different depending on the event type. So again, think about like a Java class. If you have a class of type A, you can have these fields. If you have a class of type B, you have these fields. And then there are some common fields like the object monitor and the class name and all those other kinds of things. Um, we then build specialized aggregates as needed, but only because, um, only because it improves efficiency of time series metrics, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So if you were looking at the schema, how many people are familiar with Apache Avro serialization, or Thrift, or protocol buffers, or anything cryo? Okay, fine. Anyway, it's a way of serializing data. Um, and so you can think of this as the schema, similar to like a schema in a relational database. These are what the fields look like. And again, they just give you some types that we use under the hood. This happens to be the exact Avro schema that we use to serialize things. So basically, since Avro is open source and publicly available, it's managed by the Apache Software Foundation, anybody who can speak this serialization format can uh, operate either as a producer or consumer of this real-time fire hose of data. And we don't use JSON because JSON's terrible. Yeah, I said it. Um, Especially like when you think about millions of events, when you stringify some of those things, like a number, if you have the number one, two, three, four in, uh, well, let's take one, two, three. The number, the integer one, two, three is, uh, is what, four bytes. If you turn it into a string, it's what, four, it's uh, eight times three, right? So it's significantly bigger as a string. So going from like Avro to JSON would balloon our data set sizes enormously. Anyway, so um, we then have a bunch of different event types. Um, and these event types, some of them are standard. They come out of the box with our product. Um, and they are things like syslog and HTTP request response, log4j, generic text records, all the sort of normal stuff you would expect. Users can also define custom types. So based on their systems or their hardware or whatever the case may be, um, they can define you know, sort of extensions to that. Um, Producers, so like our agent or our APIs, um, allow the user to parse a message and inject the timestamp of the event from the original message. And this is super important. How many people were in the Beam conversation earlier in this room? Okay, we have four. So anyway, um, in the world of ETL and data processing, there tends to be this phenomenon of event time, which is the time something actually happened, and processing time, which is the time that the system captured it or began processing it. If you imagine like a network partition, two machines like the network goes down or somebody has bad RAM and shuts down for 24 hours and comes back, the differential between those two times can be enormous. And this, like again, if you've ever taken like distributed systems classes, they talk about like wall clock time being terrible and not trustworthy. So uh, this is why. So an event can happen, a great example is a mobile device. You're on an airplane, you're in airplane mode, you're playing your favorite game, whatever that is, I'm, I'm too old to know what's cool anymore. Um, that game crashes, um, it can't send the crash report to Apple or Samsung. You get off the plane four hours later, your phone reconnects and then sends that data. That data is effectively four hours late according to event time, but is right on time according to processing time, right? So like there's this whole weird dichotomy. Anyway, so producers populate the event time. Um, we then have transformations that can munge and operate on this data in all kinds of different ways. And it's mostly like extracting fields and stuff like that. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, and then the event type, the class, again, if you think of that analogy, tells downstream systems how to interpret the body and the key value pairs, right? So if I don't pre-configure the system at all and I build a new application and I send a crash report and I say this is event type 117 and I put whatever I want into the body and whatever I want to the key value pairs, I can then later 
configure the system retroactively to say, hey, that event type, that payload can be parsed like this, and these are the key value pairs that exist, and you can use them. So you can sort of retroactively identify what should have been in those, those messages. More specifically, um, if you were to render these as text, like JSON, boo. Um, this is what a, a standard event would look like. So this is a uh, RFC 3164 5424, um, aka syslog, BSD syslog um, event type. So you would have a body which would be the raw bytes received on the syslog server, completely unparsed. Um, we treat this as immutable data. And then you would have the extracted key value pair. Right, so the system would parse that body and it would know, treat this as a, uh, an ASCII string and rip these fields out with this regex. So we have a whole bunch of metadata that tells us how to parse different event types and you would get all of these individual fields which can then be used for things like search and reporting and all these other kinds of things. If you're familiar with things like Logstash and Elk or the Elk stack or Splunk, again, really similar. Here's another example as an HTTP request. Again, exact same schema, but being used in a totally different way. It has its own event type, its own class, if you will. Um, again, the body might be something IIS specific, but we could parse it into generic fields so that you can compare WebSphere versus Nginx versus IIS for things like you know, request uh, times and stuff like that. Because they'll all have the same information. They'll all have URLs, they'll all have response codes, they'll all have page load times or streams, uh, 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 response times, things like that. I'm going to talk a little bit about stream processing. And again, just to remind you, I'm talking about this box of all this stuff that you probably can't read unless you have really good eyes, which I don't. I can't even read it from here, so I assume you can't. Each job, each box, orange, each orange box inside of that blue box um, is a separate stream processing job. And each one of them actually gets a full copy of the fire hose. Uh, and if you have a hard time sort of envisioning this, think of like the Twitter stream, like of just stuff, right? Just stuff. Um, each job actually gets a full copy of the stream and then decides based on rules, based on configuration, which ones it wants to use or process and which ones it wants to simply drop. And I'm gonna talk about how we can then compose those jobs in different ways. So the output of the non-terminal jobs, uh, non-terminal meaning jobs that um, feed back into Kafka rather than writing out to a storage system, is always just events. So you get an event in, you do something to it, and you spit out zero or more events. Maybe the original event, maybe you don't do anything to it. Maybe you just count them or do some kind of analytics. Um, so purely from like a functional perspective, if the signature of those jobs is event in, event out, that means all of them are composable. Right? You, can, you can rearrange the order and make them do different things. Um, all of these tend to take configuration from our UI, like users telling us how they want to process data. I want to talk specifically about the exact jobs that we have. Um, we have a transformation engine, which is the really fancy way of saying um, a thing that users can configure to do like fancy parsing and field extraction and counts and all these other kinds of things. So um, it's configuration based, so customers don't have to write code. They can actually just give us a configuration file, which is a bunch of pre-built rules that tell us how to extract stuff. We, do, um, we have a metric aggregation job whose sole job it is, is to basically just count things, min, max, sum, center deviation, so more than just count, but you get the idea. Um, this in turn builds OLAP cubes, right? So if you've ever thought about like, um, you know, what things like MicroStrategy and Tableau and sort of business intelligence tools do, the data that they need to be able to build like dynamic reports, that's what that job does. We have a model building and evaluation job. This is sort of the heart of a lot of our advanced analytics, which today is primarily machine uh, 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 anomaly detection. 
So as the events come in, we're actually training models, right, based on what they're seeing and historical data as well. So they do, they actually mix offline data with data that's streaming. They rebuild and refit models in various ways. Um, and then they, uh, in addition to just building the models, they also score the events based on like this looks weird or that looks weird. And they don't actually change the event. They generate a new event that is an anomaly event. So if you want to go in and say, show me all the anomalies that occurred in US West 2A and in EC2, we can pull that up. And because they're just events, you can also search them, you can count them, you can create alerts. This is what I mean about composability. I'll, I'll give you another example on that. We have a trigger engine, which is all about detecting complex patterns. Find um, if there are more than five failed root logins across all of my Oracle servers, I want to wake somebody up. Our trigger engine is what detects that pattern. And again, it simply outputs a new event that says, hey, I matched this pattern, which then allows us to say, is that pattern anomalous? Or to count the number of times that pattern occurs, right? We can, again, search all of these things. Um, and then we have an action engine which mostly just allows us to invoke third-party APIs. So like whenever you give it a certain event type, it will trigger an action, um, like uh, invoke an API call to PagerDuty to wake somebody up or send an email or something like that. So if you combine the trigger engine and the action engine, you have alerting, right? When you see this, when there are more than this number of failed logins, send an email. This is what's happening behind the scenes. We then have a storage job, which literally just writes all the things, right? In case we get something wrong, because we are not impervious to misconfiguration. And it's super common in these kinds of systems and in data processing and ETL and data pipelines in general, that somebody messes something up. They write a bad regular expression, they don't parse the field the right way, they count things the wrong way, and then you gotta go back, right? So we actually keep all of the raw data side by side with the parsed or, or extracted data. Just to give you an idea of what the transformation engine looks like and some of the use cases, let's say we get an event uh, from syslog, we can match it, parse it, upgrade it to like a Cisco ASA or PIX event. If we get debugging messages, we could filter those. You can do PII masking and obfuscation. This is super useful for uh, global companies that do business in places like Germany where German user data can't leave the country uh, and things like that um, where you have like actual account IDs and you mask them out um, you anonymize that data you can also do things like enrichment functions like GOIP coding and all these other kinds of things and when, like I said we use this notion of feedback loops really often so here's a here's an example so let's say we get an evil stack trace, right? Something blew up, null pointer exception. Oh no, the sky is falling. That never happens in Java code, by the way. There's no such thing as null pointer exceptions. It's totally untrue, they happen all the time. You're laughing, so I know you're with me. Um, this may pass through like our model, uh, you know, our anomaly detection engine. We say, hey, we've generated a new event called event two. I'm very creative when I'm writing these slides. Um, and we'll just say like, hey, we detected an anomaly. We then have the trigger engine configured to look for all event type two and say, hey, rule 17 matched. You know, you know I've configured a rule and I'm looking for these kinds of events. Um, and then we have, that goes back through Kafka and our action engine sees that and says, okay, I'm gonna make an API call. So each one of these can be like really small sort of microservices um, and be composed in different ways. I'm actually gonna skip metric aggregation because I have a couple minutes and I'm not talking fast enough. Um, so uh, there's a couple ways users can extend the system. They can write custom producers, hey, can you collect data from HPUX? No, not really, but you can because we'll give you the ability to do that. Custom consumers writing to different target systems, new event types, parsers and transformation rules, so on and, and so forth. So customers are able to, to do all these kinds of things. We actually use this stuff ourselves uh, to build new features into the product. Um, there's a lot of pain in building these kinds of systems. Um, if you are gonna do it, like here's some stuff that you might wanna think about. There were lots of trade-offs in picking stream processing engines. 
This is a nascent area in the, in the uh, open source ecosystem. Uh, SAMSA had some advantages, but not a lot of support. Storm was too rigid and actually too slow for a lot of the stuff we wanted to do. Flink was really new and exciting, but didn't have a lot of community around it. Spark had all the community, but a less than stellar execution engine for certain kinds of operations. Um, it was, it's, it's been a real struggle for us just around finding something that's stable enough to ship to somebody. Um, so the stack complexity and the relative immaturity is actually pretty high um, for, for this sort of ecosystem, again, in the open source world. Um, not in a lot of people were here for the Apache Beam talk, so I'm going to skip that. Um, if you're going to try this, pre please read all of the stream processing literature. Wait, like all of it? Yeah, totally like all of it, because it's a hard problem. <laughs> so uh, if you want to not make mistakes, <laughs> there's so many good academic papers on this stuff. Happy to point folks to them. Um, it is a distributed systems problem. This is not something you can shell script your way out of. It's not as simple as copy files around. Um, you have to understand and make, and then make good on your guarantees. Finding the right, right abstractions is super painful. Um, this one I can't jump up and down enough about, and I do that a lot, but this one in particular. The hand waving around the hello world, like, oh, it's just as easy. No, it's not. It's actually really, really hard. Don't ever trust that stuff. If somebody's like, look, I built Twitter in five lines of code, they've missed a couple things, right? Um, yeah. So uh, I didn't talk about a whole bunch of other stuff, believe it or not. Um, you guys can read those for yourself. I'll put the slides online if people are interested. How many minutes do I have? Do I have three? Do I have five? Do I have zero? I have three. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Uh, so the question is, are we using EMR, or are we using Clutter, uh, Clutter's distribution? So we, sh this is, we run either on-prem or in the data center, so we can't exclusively use, like, e and we actually don't use any MapReduce in the product. Um, so the short version is we don't use EMR. In the data center, we run on top of either Cloudera or Hortonworks. Those are our two big partners, and if a customer goes to do what, we just OEM, we embed one of those two. We hide it under the covers. Yeah. Are we using NiFi? Uh, we are not using NiFi today. It's actually our trap door. If, if you guys don't know Apache NiFi, go look it up. It's a great project. Um, we don't use it today, but it is our trap door for sources we don't support. So we have a plugin for NiFi that our field team uses, like if they encounter something super goofy and they're like, I have no idea how to get this data, where they can shove data directly into Kafka using NiFi. We do have two uh, NiFi committers or contributors on staff at Rokana, although we haven't done a lot with it. Did I say Rokana or Cloudera? I worked at Cloudera for four years, and I, I still make that mistake. Any other questions? All right. No one's going to ask me if I'm over-caffeinated? I am. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Eric. Uh, no, I'm not.